We've got a crisis in confidence in our higher education system. The Middle East has been destabilized with the death of Iran's president. What does it mean? And Louisiana may require schools to display the Ten Commandments. Those are today's headlines. Now let's talk about them. Classical Conversations presents Refining Rhetoric with CEO Robert Bortons, a podcast where faith, business, politics, and classical education meet. Join us as we use the classical tools of rhetoric to seek truth in every arena of life. So let's jump into today's articles. Chris, what's our first headline? All right, the crisis of confidence in higher education will not end with the student protests. This is an opinion piece from The Hill. Um, and as you, as I, as I look through this article, it looks like um, they're they're basically highlighting how all of these recent student pro- protests are they're eroding the confidence in the institution and the way that it's being handled. Um, whether it's because they're restricting the free speech or because they're they're not doing enough to support the students, and from all these different angles, everybody's upset with the way that protests are being handled. Uh, Pew survey in 2019 found that what is described as an undercurrent of dissatisfaction, even suspicion among the public out about about the role colleges play in society, the way admissions decisions are made and the extent to which free speech is constrained on college campuses. Yeah, so we've got all sorts of different shareholders in the school system. You have the students that are in there to learn in theory. You've got the professors who are employed and are supposed to be passing on knowledge and uh, checking that knowledge uh, with the student body. Then you've got the administrators who are supposed to make everything run smoothly and recruit students that will fit in. And then you've got alumni who are donating to the school. And you have, uh, you know, if you're a public school, you have state actors as well. What we see here is alumni and I think politicians in the state are saying, hey, we want these kids to be educated. We're throwing tons of money in here. Then you've got a small minority of students who are protesting. Uh, Some of them aren't even students. Uh, I've heard that in some cases up to half of them are just uh, there, you know, living on campus and joining the movement, even though they don't go to the institution. So it seems like there's more people involved. And now you have these professors that are voting no confidence in the presidents because they want uh, the president saying, hey, we need to be in the classroom learning. Obviously, the professors probably don't like that. They prefer to be out in the tents or doing whatever they're doing that's not in the classroom. And so they're saying that uh, these professors are stopping the free speech opportunities for these pro-Palestine protesters and need to be removed. This is what really happens when you continually bend the knee to woke ideology is they eventually eat their own. And I think that's what we're seeing uh, right now. But the crisis, even once this gets resolved, isn't going to end. There is no confidence in our college system. Students have no skills, a lot of debt, and are very full of themselves after graduating. And this is, of course, painting with a broad brush, but we are seeing more and more uh, businesses uh, looking elsewhere for their employees. Yeah, so this is actually further down in the article, uh, journalist Paul Tuff is quoted as saying, higher education no longer resembles a safe, reliable blue chip investment like buying a treasury bill. It's now more like going to a casino. It's a gamble that can still sometimes produce a big windfall, but it can just as likely bring financial disaster. Um, And I think that's so true. Uh, I forget what the exact number is, but something like like 80% of PhDs graduating are graduating with like $125,000 in student loans. Um, And so you're entering into a career which may be so narrowly specified that you're only qualified to teach people on the subject matter which you've just learned about. Uh, and, and And you're expecting to be able to pay back these absolutely insane loans. So we're, we're setting up all of our students for, for failure by sending them to these institutions, which are continuing to increase in cost every single year. Yeah, they're increasing in cost because the government is subsidizing those costs. But I think we're going to see a lot of schools closing down here in the next few years. And college itself, that idea is in a bad idea. It's something that uh, we should you know, want for ourselves. But 
a real college experience. And really, there's only a handful of schools left in the United States, uh, you know, probably less than 50 that are going to offer that. And very few of those are going to be public institutions at this point. So if you want to spend time and money and energy at a higher institution, you need to do so with a critical eye and thinking like, what do I want to major in? Why do I want to major in it? And will this help me reach my goals? Because only like 17% of people are in a career field related to their major, like within five years of graduating college. So not only are we paying a lot of money to, in theory, be trained for a specific career, uh, we're leaving those careers behind. And so it's very, um, it is unwise to spend four years learning something uh, without really thinking through it. So just, you know, graduating with a good GPA or high SAT score, or CLT score, and getting into college and just doing college because that's what you're supposed to do isn't working for Americans anymore. Cool. And if I can jump in and just say there's, there's been a, a sort of paradigm shift with education as a whole, right? You went to college for very specific fields like medicine or engineering, and, and we expect that si same sort of a path and streamlining towards whatever directive someone wants, wants to take. And, and the problem isn't necessarily that that's a bad thing. You want to cast out and charter your life in a direction, but that we expect every single you know, every single 18 year old to know exactly what they want to be doing when they're 45 and in what field they're going to be in is just crazy. I, I didn't know. I wasn't sure. And if I'd started just throwing money at a problem without an expected solution, I'd be in a hole of debt. And uh, as we're seeing with lots of these same institutions, and now the professors who've gone down the same channel are growing embittered against the system. And they're railing against it in, in ways that we're seeing right here, where they're losing confidence. Everybody's losing confidence in the professors because they're unable to control the direction of their class. So what do we do, Robert? Like, what, what kind of solutions are there out there? Well, I mean, I think one of the solutions is to stop the federal student loan and <laughs> all everything that's going on there because, you know, the federal government is really allowing all this to happen by printing money and giving it to college professors. And since that's a form of redistribution of wealth, it's not surprising that, you know, 90% of professors are leftists because they understand that they can't make a living uh, without the government debasing the dollar, which also destroys, um, you know, just why we have poor economic understanding here in the U.S. So as a family member, right, look for Christian institutions, uh, interview professors, you know, don't get wowed by the water slide at your college, that probably means they're investing uh, tuition dollars or state funding in places that don't actually enhance the learning experience. And uh, really just be critical uh, with those decisions. You know, what one of the things I did was looked in high school for computer engineering jobs because that's what I thought I wanted to do. And I actually spent almost two years uh, doing you know, a computer engineering internship before going to college. And part of that was learning that I did not want to be a computer programmer, uh, but I did like the engineering side of it. And so even if you uh, do that in high school, like if I had done that in college, I could have had to switch majors halfway through, you know, take some new classes, spend more money uh, versus being uh, actually earn money and learn what I did and didn't want to do in a environment without a whole lot of pressure in it. So you know, start earlier, you know, if there's, you know, hey, what do you want to major in or what do you think you want to do in your life? You know, when they're a junior, find an internship for them that summer. You know, if they liked it, do it again their senior year. If they want to try something else, you know, if they're like, oh, I want to either do, you know, nursing or business, you know, <laughs> see if you can find uh, a uh, internship the next summer that's uh, related to the other thing they're interested in. And so even if they find out they don't want to do either of those things, that's a huge blessing because uh, they can, uh, you know, look for another direction and they're going to start just by interacting in those businesses, find different things. So businesses are always looking for students, uh, start early, even, I know a lot of times you just knock out general ed credit that first semester or first year, you know, go ahead and find an internship that first summer that's going to be related to some skills that uh, you want to develop. So college still has its place, but it's not a place where every American should go. Uh, should really only go if you have a very particular specific reason to. 
All right, Robert, I'm going to segue us from here into uh, back to uh, not Palestine, but nearby. So um, May 20th, I think this is when this is breaking, that the uh, Iranian president, Abraham Raisi, uh, was in a helicopter crash. Um, and so now they're they're looking for what's next for the country. They've lost their, their president. Yeah, well, what was interesting on X, they actually, the Israel news agency reported this about six hours before it was confirmed by Iran uh, that it was, uh, that he was indeed dead, as well as uh, some other members of his uh, leadership group. Interesting thing, you know, of course, this is tied into Palestine because Iran was one of the major funders of the Palestine war uh, and attack on Israel. What's also interesting is uh, Iran did attack Israel as well. Uh, so it is very um, potentially destabilizing. Iran is not in a good place financially, despite Joe Biden giving them billions of dollars through his presidency. And so this has the major potential to disrupt everything that's going on in the Middle East. We're obviously recording this on the 21st of May. So by the time you listen, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, we could already see some uh, war escalating or Iran uh, potentially going into civil war as you have different uh, groups that uh, are going to want to fill this power vacuum. And I think it's important to know that uh, you know, there's about 90 million people in that country. And um, there's just a number of different groups that uh, are going to want to have political power. So it's going to be potentially destabilizing event. They rely, of course, on oil. Uh, a lot of it they sell to China and Russia. So I don't know that it's going to have a significant impact on oil prices uh, in the short term, but it definitely could. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, who fills this power vacuum. So I think one of the reasons we're seeing escalating tensions in the Middle East is because the weed of secularism is dying out globally. Um, I don't, I don't think that the Middle East is becoming any more secular with society and with technology. If anything, they're becoming more religious and, uh, Iran, both Israel, um, all the other countries in, the, in that area and, and the same things happening in the West. So I'm going to segue us into this story coming out of Louisiana. Yeah. So here we go. Louisiana state, uh, Louisiana Senate has passed a bill 30 to eight that requires the display of the 10 commandments at all schools that receive public funding including colleges and universities. This bill will require a second vote in front of the full house in which it is expected to pass before it lands on Governor Jeff Landry's desk for signature. Yeah, really interesting. Of course, uh, Louisiana is requiring this in the public schools um, on public property, the Ten Commandments. And that's one of the things that uh, conservatives, Christians have said, oh, we need to put prayer back in school and the Ten Commandments back in school. So it's going to be interesting to see if uh, one uh, that makes it through the legal muster and also will we really see this changing our school systems, like is dictating the Ten Commandments in there going to be helpful? Could this change? I mean, could California or Michigan require, you know, some sort of documents from Islam or some other, uh, you know, religion or of course, we see the LGBTQ stuff all over uh, public schools already. So I'm not sure if this is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm also wondering if schools that take voucher students will be required to do this. Um, and again, what would impact be if you know Louisiana suddenly becomes a blue state and they decide to uh, you know put in Islamic law or decide to put in you know the you know, 10 things LGBTQ people should uh, be embraced for uh, all over these school buildings. So it's going to be interesting. They actually have sizes on it. It has to be, uh, yeah, I think it has to be decent size, 11 by 14 inches, the bill state. And it was 30 to 8 in the House. And I think it got passed in the Senate too. This sounds a lot like the uh, OSHA compliance uh, posters that they place in workplaces, kind of like the workers' rights ones. Like this is kind of the same thing. But I think you're you're exactly right. It doesn't matter as much what's happening in terms of what's going on with the state funding. Uh, it's more about the fact that there is still state funding. Um, I I think you and I would both prefer that 
that gets reduced and limited and maybe even removed entirely as opposed to just redirected to another agenda, um, even if the agenda falls in line with my my beliefs. So I yeah, don't know. Um, Is it a good thing? Yeah, I think, I guess the last year they said, in God we trust had to be put in all the classrooms uh, as well. So there's obviously um, some cost to the taxpayers going on here. One of the voters that people who voted against it, Royce Duplessis, a Democrat from New Orleans, says she was raised Catholic, uh, but I didn't learn the Ten Commandments in school. Uh, we went to Sunday school. That's why we have church. You want your kids to learn about the Ten Commandments. Take them to church is what she said. And so, yeah, I don't know if uh, this is a good or bad thing. You know, when people say, oh, we need to add these things back into school, I always go, well, school had these things in them. And it still created the environment to have them removed. So I don't know that going back 50 or 60 years and putting in laws or rules that were in place then that didn't work the first time will start working the second time. But I do think learning the Ten Commandments is uh, a part of a well-rounded education. So it'll be interesting to hear whether they use that as, you know, hey, these are the core values that we're going to live by or not, and uh, who's God and what God. Just because you have things like that say, uh, in God we trust, you know, what does that really mean? So I don't know. Probably not a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know that it's going to move the needle on, you know, people accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior. Whitewashing tombs. Yeah, and I do like that example you gave of the uh, all the wage stuff that you have to put up at work. I mean, it's just so, you just ignore it. So I don't know. I don't think I've ever ever read a single line on one of those. I know they're there. Cool. It'll be interesting. We'll see if it gets passed and if the court allows it. And then whether people of Louisiana want to fund all of these, uh, you know, posters being put into schools it's, or not. This ties back to, sorry, I'm, I'm, I know you're kind of running down, but I want to, I want to tie it back to what we started with, um, which is the the lost confidence in higher education, and it goes all the way through the system. I mean, it, higher education can't produce any sort of results independent of the education that precedes it. And so if our our middle school and our high schools are sucking, well, then the same thing is going to happen to the, the higher education. Um, yeah, let's take it all the way back to back, you know, in the in the 17, 1800s when it was dame schools, when it was like 15 mothers in a township that were getting together and being like, hey, you have them today. I'll get them tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got the public school colleges that are producing our teachers and producing teachers that don't know how to teach, only manage classrooms and have, you know, been really uh, indoctrinated with CRT, DEI global warming nonsense. And then we put them into these classrooms to teach our young people, well, no matter what the curriculum says or what's hung on the wall, the adult in the room is really teaching from their worldview. And so it's a big circle. It's a, you know not a circle of success. It's a circle of failure. And really the best thing to do for all of us is to get our kids out, um, start homeschooling them, or send them to a private school, pay our own education bills, don't expect our neighbors to pay for our kids' education, and uh, really embrace that responsibility. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Continue to pay attention to what's going on in our education system and the world around us so that we can uh, better love our neighbors and we can better prepare our children for what is to come. Uh, until next time, keep watching Refining Rhetoric on YouTube. Follow me on X, The Robert B. Show, and we would love to hear from you there. All right. See you next week. Why don't you take a trip to the Great Wolf Lodge? And it has locations around the nation. It's family friendly. It's complete with sweet style rooms, plenty of entertainment, water parks, and many more attractions your family can enjoy. And the best part is that you get a discount code by listening to my show. And you can go to greatwolf.com, type in the code CLAS432A at checkout to get up to 30% off. Of course, you can find that code in the show notes, but there are locations near you. Just head to Great Wolf Lodge's website at 
greatwolf.com and type in that code CLAS432A and get up to 30% off for your family. So we'll see you there. Welcome to Classical Crypto with Will. So great to be with you today. And wow, what a week in in crypto. Just absolutely incredible. I don't I really don't know where to start. So today is going to be a highlight reel of all that has happened here in the last second to last week of of May. It's just absolutely amazing because for months we've heard this narrative switching. We've ter- we've talked a lot about BlackRock and politicians and CEOs and everyone changing their mind all of a sudden on cryptocurrency going, hey, it was rat poison. Now it's a flight to safety. Now it's, oh my goodness, the dollar's blood money and debt and all these things. Oh, crypto can be can be tracked. There's a limited supply. This is sound money, but we've been hearing that. But now we're starting to see tangible things happen in the market, bringing this to pass and talks of regulation coming in which needs to happen for this to be fully adopted. So fantastic week. Let's go through the highlights of what went on here in May. Starting out with Coinbase relisting XRP in New York. So the citizens of New York could not buy XRP since 2020. So when the SEC sued Ripple, Coinbase shut down, also the state really shut down the sales of the XRP token and blocked everyone from getting it. They just relisted it. It's almost four years later, three and a half years later, got it relisted. So now if you're in the state of New York, you can legally buy that token. That happened this week, which was absolutely crazy. Additionally, President Trump, out of the blue, listed, I think it was seven cryptos on his website. So now he is taking campaign donations in cryptocurrency. This includes Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, and XRP, and a few others. But wow. And again, I'm a supporter. But a few years ago, Trump was saying no crypto, strong dollar, I'm against it. Now he's fully, fully adopting it. And he's made several public statements where he's been very pro crypto. So that's awesome. I might throw him some cryptocurrency on the side. So next, on May 23rd, the Ethereum ETF was approved. Wild, really out of nowhere. There was so much talk and speculation about that Bitcoin ETF, which we've been talking about. There was so much speculation and we've been talking about that Bitcoin ETF coming out. But man, boom, Ethereum got approved. Now that's super exciting in and of itself, but this leads so many to believe and speculate that other cryptocurrencies, other cryptos in that top 10 will most likely be approved and have their own ETFs probably sooner than later. And there could be some ETFs that have multiple cryptocurrencies inside of it where you could buy one share that includes Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, BNB, some of those larger coins in that one purchase. So that would be incredible. That was a big surprise to me that that was approved this last week. And finally, something notable made the news. Cynthia Loomis, who is a wonderful U.S. Senator, she really has been spearheading crypto and bringing it to Capitol Hill. She is the champion uh, on the Hill for many of us who are pro-crypto. I've seen her at Bitcoin conferences, etc. She excited the U.S. and the world of pro-crypto people by saying, hey, I've been hard at work and I can see that there is a pro-crypto army here in Congress. So she is working hard to bring people over, educate them on the benefits of blockchain and digital assets. And she said, we are gaining traction. I am building a pro crypto army. So it was great to see that traction from her, ex-president Trump getting on board, that ETF approved and regulation coming in. And as it starts to come in, as the SEC's position starts to weaken, it's great to see states like New York reaccepting and relisting crypto assets. This has been Classical Crypto with Will. Join me next time to hear how the White House is getting excited and they're ready to work with crypto. We will talk about that next time. Thank you for listening to Refining Rhetoric with Robert Bordens. Want more? 
make sure to subscribe so you won't miss an episode. You can also follow us on social media to continue the conversation and visit classicalconversations.com forward slash rhetoric to find out how you can join a local homeschool community.